Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other all about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be contempted condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. On this third Sunday of Easter, I want you to imagine that we find ourselves traveling on a road that's somehow painfully familiar. All of us have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic. In Jesus' time in the Roman province of Palestine, everyone was affected by the chaos created by this Jesus and his entourage. Every one of us knows this road. Regardless of who we are, what we do, whatever our health or financial circumstances, we've walked it. We've lost our way on it. We've even left it only to return to it sometimes. The road is the road to Emmaus, and we recognize it by the words we speak when we set out on this uneven and winding road once again. But we had hoped but we had hoped the diagnosis wasn't cancer. We had hoped our marriage would get easier. We had hoped our children would be safe. We had hoped the market would rally. We had hoped our depression would lift. We had hoped to keep our jobs. We had hoped to carry the baby to term. We had hoped the pandemic would spare our family. We had hoped for a peaceful death, surrounded by our family. We had hoped to experience God's presence when we pray. We had hoped our faith would survive this latest crisis. Now the words we speak on our road to Emmaus are words of pain, discouragement, confusion, and yearning. They are the words we say when we come to the end of our hopes when our expectations have been dashed, our cherished dreams shattered, and there's nothing left to do but give up and move on down the road, defeated and despairing. But we had hoped. In our gospel story this week, we meet two of Jesus' disciples. One is named Cleopas, we are told. As they are discussing all that has happened, how Jesus had taught and healed, how that same Jesus had been betrayed, flogged, and made a spectacle of shame, and how he had breathed his last and was laid in a sealed tomb. Add to all this the report that Jesus' body was apparently now missing, and listen to the confusion and the questions fly. How could this have happened? He had been taken. What are we to do now? Where do we go from here? The two disciples have a while, seven miles, to roll these details over, to ruminate on this loss, and wonder at these strange occurrences as they trudge to Emmaus. Questions about what was true and what ifs animate their footsteps amidst exhaustion, 
and abandonment. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. It's a statement saturated with honesty and pain, a confession of sorts. They had bet their lives on this Jesus. This was the one who was to restore Israel, to lift up the lowly and fill the hungry with good things. This was the one for whom generations had longed, hope built upon hope for centuries. It's hard to imagine the weight of their grief, to imagine the intensity of their loss, to imagine all that compounded by utter confusion. Actually, it not, might not be all that hard to imagine for some of us. An Emmaus road is familiar to many of us this side of heaven. It's a well-worn path dotted with our defeats and disappointments, marked by sinking diagnoses, inevitable questions, and disbelief. Life's seasons and circumstances often determine how steep or winding or rocky such a road is, but many of us have trod it, whether in the past or in the present. This year, as the COVID-19 crisis continues to wreak havoc around the world, I am grateful for the honest witness of this post-resurrection story. I'm grateful that the journey continues into Easter even when hope is possible but not yet realized. I'm grateful that even the road to Emmaus, the road of brokenness, the road of failure, is a sacred road because it's a road that Jesus walks. A road that honors our deep disappointment even as it holds out possibilities of nourishment and revelation. We long for a time when we will gather once again on Sunday mornings, when we will see each other face to face and not on Zoom. We long for the time when we will say the prayers, hear the stories, and the words of the Eucharist, when we will once again receive the bread and wine, taking Christ's body into ours. The beauty is that we can experience week in and week out in the scriptures is that the living God meets us on this road. The loving God comes alongside us and unexpectedly in moments of loss and difficulty. The life-giving God walks with us in times that promote despair and despondency, whether we realize it or not. And this is precisely what Cleopas and his companion experience on the Emmaus Road as they encounter a stranger mid-step. What were you discussing with each other as you walk along, he asks. Cleopas and his companion look at each other in astonishment. This guy must have been hiding under a rock. Otherwise, why on earth would he ask about the strange things that had transpired since everyone was affected by the situation in Jerusalem? Little do the disciples know that this is the one whom they have been mourning. Maybe it's grief obscuring their vision. Maybe hypotheticals have dulled their senses. Or maybe these disciples were too entangled in their own shattering hopes. Whatever it is, they fail to recognize the one in their midst. But Jesus hears them out. He listens to their stories of disappointment, at the heart of which is his absence. He hears how he handed over condemned and crucified, buried with the hopes of Israel. He hears of how his body is missing. Jesus walks with his dejected followers listening intently. Even if their story isn't news to Jesus, the disciples' hearts and dreams are breaking, spilled out before this stranger. The disciples tell this stranger, the women went to the tomb and did not find him. The irony is surely not lost on us as we hear this story. Though Jesus is in front of their eyes, the disciples fail to see him. Jesus asks, have you not heard the prophets? 
Have their words not sunk in? Remember Moses and your forebears in the faith. Remember the prophets. Remember the scriptures dripping with promise. The disciples' hearts begin to burn as they wonder about the identity of this stranger. But there is still something, some doubt, that clouds their vision and obscures their eventual recognition of who is walking and talking with them. If we read in the other Gospels, though, this is pretty typical of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. It takes time, or some sort of personal revelation, for this otherworldly visitation to register. Remember the story of Mary Magdalene confusing the risen Christ for a gardener. Remember, too, that startling scene on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, immediately after the Emmaus Road episode, when we read that it takes some time for the disciples' eyes to recognize what appears like a ghost as the risen Christ himself. In that scene, food plays a critical role. Jesus eats broiled fish, something no ghost can claim to do. Such a simple act strengthens the disciples' belief. Such a simple act strengthens their courage. Today, too, Jesus is known in the blessing, breaking, and giving of bread, again showing that the Savior resurrects humanity from the most basic stuff of life. It is nearly impossible for those disciples not to have connected this supper with the Last Supper, I think there is too powerful a connection with the two meals not to see a common bread and a common host. In this simple act of blessing, breaking, and giving of bread, we're told something dramatic happened. As Jesus tears apart that simple loaf, crumbs fall to the floor. The disciples' crumbs of disbelief and hopelessness also fall. And the disciples' eyes, once clouded with tears, become open to the realities of the resurrection and the impermanent character of death. If the Emmaus Road narrative teaches us anything, it is that God has a leaning toward brokenness, which we see repeatedly in the life, death, and ministry of Jesus. Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us that Jesus seems to gravitate toward those whose lives are split open, either by sickness or loss or disappointment. It is in the cracks in our humanity that divine resurrected life shines the brightest. With the sun setting on all their hope for Israel's redemption, Cleopas and his companion are forced to acknowledge their lives broken open, their dreams scattered on that dusty highway. But it is in that moment that Jesus comes alongside them, opens up the scriptures again, and reminds them once again of the very foundation of their hope. The disciples hear the great narrative of God's history altering love from the lips of love himself. And when all the scriptures have been unpacked and interpreted, when all the loose ends have been tied up, a meal reinforces the point for them and for us. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.
The prayers of the people are form three, found on page 387 in the Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who commended themselves to our prayers, especially remembering this week, Bill, Bob, Carol, Constance, Diane, Doris, Gary, James, Jane, Jim, and all those affected by natural disasters and human tragedies. The first responders and the aid and relief efforts that continue around the world, especially for everyone affected by the coronavirus and all, on all others who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, especially all who have died from COVID-19. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy, and we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. We pray especially for peace in our homes and around the world, remembering those who have lost their homes and families to violence here or abroad, as well as those who serve and protect our own freedom, especially Will, Stephen, Harrison, Matt, Becky, Jeff, Jennifer, Steve, Philip, and Perrin, for their safety and the just use of the power that is placed in their hands. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others I invite your petitions and thanksgivings offered silently or aloud. Loving God, inspire us to reach out to those facing life's changes and challenges. Guide and empower our pastoral care team and especially all our Stephen ministers and leaders as they provide spiritual companionship to those in need of support and understanding. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and remain with you this day and always. Amen.